How's it growing? We have been enjoying fresh star fruit and other fruits as well. Uh, this is Barbados cherry. One Barbados cherry has more vitamin C than a typical orange. It's just so incredible. And I'm excited that recently I got a dehydrator and so I've been able to dehydrate some of my fruit. Papaya and oh, mango. Mango, when it's dehydrated, is like candy. It's so good. Anyway, Amy, Be Green with Amy, had me on her show again for another Q&A session. So let's get right to it. Welcome to Be Green with Amy. I'm Amy. Since 2012, I've been coaching people to join me in achieving their plant-based lifestyle goals of weight loss and improved health. So please post your questions for our guest. You can post comments. You could even say where you're from, or you could even type in, be strong, be well, and be green. Just test voice. Let's welcome our guest. David Stack has a YouTube channel, Stack's Urban Harvest, with a mission to inspire and educate new gardeners to grow their own food and help them shorten the learning curve using organic methods. Please subscribe and click like to help be green with Amy. Welcome, David Stack. Greetings and welcome, David. Hi, Amy. Good to see you again. Yes, for those that didn't see you the first time, this is your your returning on to the show, and I'm really glad to have you back. Good to be back. Thank you for having me. So the time that we're doing this live broadcast is a time that people in the southern areas, and David's in southwest Florida, they're just kind of getting ready to start their gardens. But as David was telling me before we went on air, this information is going to be applicable to many of you, even who live in the North, at the time that you're getting ready to prepare for your garden. So this is really going to be helpful for everyone. So David, what are you doing to prepare for your garden? Right now, I have, I've got my seedlings behind me, most of the seedlings. I haven't planted the tomatoes yet. So I have three square foot garden beds. One of them is going to have the tomatoes and then one is going to be mostly leafy greens with some herbs and other companion plants, like say marigolds and some wildflowers, bring some pollinators in. And then the third bed is, is going to be mostly herbs, a lot of fennel and dill. I love uh, those two, lots of herbs and probably all the gardens, all the beds. These are my, my seedlings that I started uh, a couple months ago, actually. Oh, look at that. So we got some lemon balm, some sage, uh, onions are good. They're really good for companion planting. Kohlrabi last season was the first time I, I grew kohlrabi and it grew pretty well. Uh, and then I got Swiss chard over here, a number of things. I'm excited to get the beds. So I, I'm going to start planting uh, the first bed this coming weekend. Wow. So tell us about your little setup there. Uh, these are just grow lights, you know, very cheap grow lights that you can get on Amazon. And then this is a click and grow, uh, grow system that uh, you can buy pods of, you know, of like basil and other herbs to, to grow indoors and they'll do pretty well. But then once that's done, then I actually fill the pods with mostly perlite and then a layer of vermiculite at the top and use that as a seed starter for what I'm going to grow in the fall. It's, I'm not uh, familiar with it. So tell me what click and grow is. It's, it's the brand name of oh, okay. the grow system. Yeah. Now that's yeah, not hydroponic though, right? Because you said you actually have this, like... this is hydroponic, oh, okay. and it's the only hydroponic thing I, I use. You you keep them in indoors hydroponically all all season long. Yeah, but you know this time of year I use it to to as I'm starting. It's a it's a great way to as a plant starter to start seedlings, and unless you buy their pods, it's not really good long term unless you're gonna you know add the chemicals to the, the water and do the whole hydroponic thing and my thing with hydroponics is it's not really organic and i like to go organic uh, whenever possible so 
Yeah, that's, I agree with the hydroponic uh, as your, far as your viewpoint goes. I'm, I'm not a fan. I think I think it's great, you know, to do if you if that's what you have access to and that's what you can use. I think it's great, but I think given the choice, I would prefer not to to use it. And I always wonder about all the chemicals, you know, when you do it, on, especially if people do it on a big scale, where, you know, what happens to all those chemicals in, in our environment and. So that's why I kind of feel the way you do as far as it, it, I don't feel like it's organic because I feel like the chemicals are doing something to our environment. So, but that's, it's just a fun thing to, to experiment with on a small scale, just right. to see what you can do. Right. So now you, do you do this square foot gardening method? Yeah, I, I've got a few slides I want to share with, uh, on my other screen here. Okay. Uh, I grew up in Southern California and, and then when I moved to Florida, we have a lot of challenges. The soil is, it's not really soil. It's dead dirt. Dirt is dead to me. This is the place that we, we moved to. This is where we live now. And when we moved here, it, it looked like this. Oh it was just my. A, lot, a lot of dead dirt. This was the eyesore of the neighborhood. So here's, here's what, Okay, here's an, a few more pictures of our house, what a mess it was. Okay, and that you, was and you, you decided to, to move into this house, being being a gardener. You were in up 20, for this in challenge. 2011, <laughs> with all this, all this dead dirt. You couldn't walk across what was supposed to be grass there without getting burrs in your socks. Wow. And this is where we live now. I mean, this is the same place, same yard. Uh, of course... We put in a pool and you know put in some some landscaping, but it took a truckload of compost uh, to liven up the soil. That's beautiful. So we got some banana trees there, banana plants. Excuse me, people call them trees. So this is the before and after. That is amazing. You can see what the difference microbes in the soil can do biology the right biology because healthy soil leads to healthy plants leads to healthy people and then i started stack server and harvest uh, last year uh, after i was furloughed because i wanted to share what i learned during my learning curve and help shorten that learning curve for other people and dealing with the challenges now here's just a quick little thing about something i'm grafting so you don't think of eggplant as being a rare fruit, right? Yeah. But how about when it grows on an eight or nine foot tree? I have this grafted to a wild cousin called uh, turkey berry or Solanum torvum. And so it, this is uh, this is about eight feet tall. It's uh, above the, the gutters on, on our house. And it's just starting to produce some, some eggplant. So, That's amazing. <laughs> so... Fruit trees. We've we've got a lot of fruit trees, and you know I I'm just so amazed that people, if they have the land, and why are they putting a lot of ornamental trees when they could plant something that feeds them? You know these are our avocados that are producing for the first time this year. We're excited about that, uh, and down here we can grow tropical fruit like star fruit, also known as carambola. And this is this was taken just a couple of weeks ago. I looked out there today, and uh, these are turning yellow and ripening. Wow! And black sapote. This is related to persimmon, and uh, it, this is also fruiting for the first time for us this year. We're excited about that. Oh, it's also known as chocolate fruit, tr um, chocolate pudding tree, because well the you open it up and it's not ripe until it's mushy and it's the substance and color of chocolate pudding and it's not quite as sweet but add some sugar to it and you're good to go yeah. <laughs> i know people who use that as their desserts wow and uh, our newest our latest arrival here butterscotch sapodilla and uh, I don't know if you've ever had sapodilla fruit. No, I haven't. It is delicious. So del And there's, there's so many of these tropical fruits that most Americans have never heard of. 
this is a an ice cream banana tree i'm sorry there i go again banana plant and uh it's also called blue java so square foot gardening this is uh we we got the second edition there's also the third edition which i haven't read but the third the second edition is what someone handed me when i was struggling and trying to figure out gardening and i kind of what i did i read this book and i was like i'm definitely gonna have to try this i highly recommend it it's, especially if you live in south florida this is the way to go so a big part of square foot gardening is planning what you're going to do the very top box is is my first box and then the nightshade box number two and then the third box on the bottom i rotate this every season there's a whole thing of plant, plant uh i'm sorry crop rotation and so when you say uh, rotate you mean that you have three beds and you'll take basically the same plan but move it to a different bed Yes, each right. season. Okay. So each, so I rotate where the tomatoes are going to go. And, and so next year it'll go in like, say, bed number three instead of two okay. or, you know, move every switch everything around. So that's that's a good practice for a number of reasons. And then I like I mentioned earlier, companion plants. So certain herbs are really good companion plants with like, say, tomatoes and cabbage i'm growing cabbage and mint in the same square the mint will help deter you know the pests for the cabbage is that right that's a that's good to know but now i think i heard that mint can really take over a garden so is that you, that's not a concern for you not really because by the end of the growing season i dig everything out pull, pull everything out and i solarize during the summer and that's a whole nother thing I have two of my beds still under plastic, solarizing to kill the root knot nematodes, which are a big problem down here. Yeah, you've been really keeping busy and, and planning things out. And that you said tomatoes. Now, if people who are living in the northern areas, then tomatoes is, is a, an easy, fairly easy thing for them to grow. And I always find it frustrating that if I go into one of those big box stores in the garden centers, in, in if I'm in some place like Southwest Florida, they'll have the same tomato plants that they would sell in the northern place. And people struggle with growing most kinds of tomatoes here. So what do you say about that? You got to know what to plant and when to plant it. Uh, if you, I see people trying to grow tomatoes uh, during the summer and I, you know, I, I did that. I've been there. I, that was one of the mistakes I, I made. And I, I finally realized it's too much work for what I'm getting out of it. Know that during the cool months here, that is the, uh, the perfect time to grow tomatoes. And also if you're still having uh, trouble with it, don't try to grow the, the big tomatoes you know, they have um, some challenges. Maybe you've got a problem with root knot nematodes. You know, if your tom tomato plants are never doing well and they're always susceptible to disease and pests, well, by when you finally pull up that plant and take a look at the roots, or do they have knots on the roots? Those knots are those soil parasites getting into the roots and making your plant unproductive and susceptible to pests and disease. It's always the weak plants that, that get the, the diseases and, and the, the pests. So you want to have strong, healthy soil too. A, a good soil by biodiversity. A healthy soil is not going to have as much of a problem with the soil parasites. So how do you like to prepare your soil? This coming weekend, I'll be adding a lot of compost. I'll be adding about two to four inches. Uh, yeah, about two to four inches of, of compost and uh, worm castings and azomite rock dust. It's a, it's a rock dust that's full of trace minerals early on in the growing seed because that takes a, a long time for the to break down and for the microbes to to make it 
available to the plant. So another thing I do is there's, there's a mineral spray that comes from the ocean called sea crop. And I, I buy that. For those that are down here in South Florida, Tree Amigos Growers in Davie are a great resource for this sort of thing. They have sea crop. It's had most of the salt extracted from that. So there might be, you know, very trace amounts. And that's why you don't want to use too much of it. you got to follow the directions. So you uh, mix it up. And I'll, I'll do one drench in the soil. And then I'll do two two foliar sprays. So I'm, I'm mixing it into, you know, one of those spray pump sprayer things and spray it on the, the leaves, the foliage of the plants. So I'll do that. Not all at once. I'll do two applications of that separated by, you know, maybe a month or so. Sounds like you, you've kind of over the time you've accumulated some of this knowledge to you know, and that, and I mean, i I'm doing, plant-based lifestyle and I think you are too and I always love how they parallel because we talk about the gut microbiome and how what you eat feeds your gut microbiome and then that determines how much immunity you have to diseases and you're talking about feeding the soil because mm -hmm. that's going to also create that microbiome for the plant Did for the you soil wanna yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that is the soil microbiome. And that's, I'm glad you brought that up. And as far as a uh, plant-based lifestyle, I'm, I'm not vegan or vegetarian, but I'm eating much less meat. And I really respect those who have been, who have gone vegan or vegetarian. I think you can be much healthier by eating less meat or, or no meat. So um, right. I love, I love growing my own food too, and and enriching my uh, my diet with that. This is some of my green smoothie. Uh huh. That you, and you get you that from your garden too. When you were talking about rotating crops, I was thinking because I I have um, longevity spinach, and this is a popular plant for newbie gardeners, especially in in South Florida, because. It's basically you stick it in the ground and it grows. And as it gets longer, you can just cut off a piece and stick that in the ground and it'll grow. So I have this one bed, one garden bed, and it just became <laughs> a whole bed of longevity mm. spinach. Now it's much more than, than I can eat. In the beginning, it was great. But now I'm like, oh, my goodness, what, what I do I do with all this? So. If I was going to rotate crops, I, I would really have to work on that and get all that long. But it does so, flower, which was surprising to me. I didn't expect that. It was very beautiful. Well, crop rotation is, is when, I, when I say crop rotation, I'm referring to annuals, okay. uh, not, not the perennial. So that's a perennial that can stay where it's at. Um, although, you know, I have longevity spinach growing in a number of places in my garden and so i'll have it and it, it'll be doing well in one spot and then and then it'll it, it'll die back and something else will take over there and so and then i'll have another spot where it wasn't growing well and then and then and then it decides to take off so that's why i like to grow it in different places in, in the garden and then just see what happens and then there's Okinawa spinach. Are you familiar with that? I am, but I don't have any. Okay. I should send you a cutting because oh. <laughs> Okinawa spinach is very closely related to, to, uh, to longevity spinach, but it's uh, got purple underneath the leaves. And I don't think it has the same health properties, but it's, it is known to, uh, it's known to to cut your cholesterol, but I think oh. most most a lot of foods that we eat from from the garden do do that also. Yeah. Now that's also perennial. Yes. Okay. It, it has a different growing habit though. It's a little more of a bush than than a you know how longevity spinach is kind of like a, a thick ground cover. Yeah. Speaking of, of sending me things, that's basically how we met. 
I was on Facebook and I really wanted to have a Moringa tree, but I don't have a very large yard. And I saw David posting something about dwarf Moringas. And I said, oh, I, I think I have to do this. So I got in touch with him and we arranged it that he could send me uh, some little seeds from the pods. And because it's something that grows so easily, even I, even though I'm bee green with Amy, I'm not very green in the garden, but I do very well when, when it's something that just is perennial or something that's easy to grow. And uh, so it, it, it really did very well. I started it off in, in a pot and I didn't really know how tall it would get. And I'm, I'm wondering, I'm going to ask you a question from me. So I have this dwarf Moringa that's taller than me now. <laughs> and I didn't do very much to it. So it's just got a, a very long, high trunk. And then it's almost like a little palm tree the way it looks because everything is just kind of growing on top. And now, even though it's a dwarf Moringa, it's too high up for me <laughs> to reach those. So yeah. can I can I like hack it and it'll grow and get bushier? I'm afraid to you, do anything. No, they do better with a lot more trimming so i have some i have one that i i i chopped it all the way down to the trunk down to this as a stump i mean it was like a stump this high off the ground and it grew back with a vengeance <laughs> and it but in such healthy vibrant growth it just sprang back to life and it's just outside my window here uh you can't see it with the camera but uh, and it's, yeah, I, I de definitely recommend keeping Moringa trimmed down to like four or five feet. Okay. And mine just keeps growing, towering over the house. I've got mm -hmm. about four of those trees, three or four of those. Yeah, four of them. And I'm going to, each year, I'm going to chop another one down to the ground and just see it come back. I, I felt like I had enough Moringa and I needed a little more space. But then when it came back, I was like, you know, I'll just, it wants to come back and I'll let it come back because the, it's a good, it's good for another thing called chop and drop. It's good for chopping, chop and drop is a permaculture um, term where there's three things that are usually mentioned for chop and drop. There's comfrey, moringa, and uh, tithonia. It's the Mexican sunflower it means exactly what it sounds like you chop it and you drop it and then you let it let mother nature do its thing and it it just decays and adds organic matter did you know organic matter holds 10 times its weight in in water you, you get microbes going the good microbes and uh so that that adds a lot to the soil think about the forest what would the forest do well things branches fall off and leaves are always falling off and it adds to it becomes the next soil cycle as it decays yeah so, uh, i think some carb rock said something i think i just saw a comment it said carb rock said i like to think of the soil as a plant's digestive tract that's really interesting that Carb mentioned that because I don't have the graphic. I should have had it ready because I saw this really cool graphic and I'll, I'll try to post it on my uh, Be Green with Amy Facebook page. And it shows the digestive tract of a, of a human. And then on next to it, it shows the root of a plant. And when you look at it, the root of the plant has all these little hairs that are hair like things that are sticking out of the root all the way around and that's how it kind of absorbs the nutrients from that microbiome of the soil and then when you look at the human digestive tract it looks like that plant root that's turned inside out and all those little hair like things that you see out there they're inside the digestive tract and that's where the human digestive system absorbs the nutrients in through th those little villi or what hair hair like things that they have so yeah i i agree it's mm -hmm. kind of kind of very similar isn't it yeah it's fascinating nature is just so fascinating and we need to get back to how nature does things on my youtube channel i have cynthia schaefer 
who has her own series on my channel. Between her and I, we present two totally different methods of organic gardening. Now, I will talk about using the very common pest control and disease control things like neem oil and uh, and other other things. But her thing is, what would the forest do? Like I just said, and so she has a very hands-off approach and see and just let nature do whatever it needs to do. And I'm kind of leaning towards that a little more as, as the years go by. And, and a good example of that is that eggplant tree that I just showed you. A couple months ago, I saw aphids were taking it over, to, taking over the leaves. And I'm, I was like, oh, shoot, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I, I don't want to have to use neem oil because it stresses out the plant. And it, you definitely want to, don't want to use it during the day. Uh, you want to use it, if you are going to use it, use it as the sun is going down or, or at least in the shade. So I, then I saw a ladybug and I thought, you know what, I'm going to hold off before I do anything. You know, there, there is the method of spraying the, spraying it with the water, spray the bugs off with the water. But I just decided to just give it a day or two and see what the lady and well, the next day there were two ladybugs. And then the next day, there were still two ladybugs cleaning it up, cleaning it up, and there were fewer aphids. And then I saw, uh, started seeing ladybugs in different stages. There was a lar larvae, and there was, uh, there were two la ladybugs procreating, and you know the, they nature was doing its thing, and and my a, my plant is aphid free, and I can. Any day I can go out there and find a ladybug, at least one. So I have something that is attracting ladybugs to my garden and I want to keep them here. Exactly, because I've heard of people who buy uh, ladybugs mm -hmm. and then they release them in their garden and then they all fly away. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do that every now and then. I haven't done that for a while. You know, we have the butterfly world where you can you can buy ladybugs. I always call ahead to make sure they have them in stock if I'm going to get them. But yeah, the, most of them will fly away. And but I've released so many packages of those over the years. I think some have hung around the neighborhood, and I like to think that the ones that are cleaning up my garden right now are descendants from from those that I've released. Right. Yeah. I. I remember um, we're, we're trying to get uh, a Dr. Ron Weiss. He is actually a medical doctor. He practices in New Jersey. He, he practices plant-based medicine, but uh, he also has a garden. He moved his practice to a huge uh, multi-acre land in New Jersey, and he's making all these organic uh, foods that he's growing. And um, he talks about how the plants that are grown organically and are not treated so much with this pesticides and herbicides that they grow stronger because they're fighting off the pests and diseases and that the nutrients in these plants, because the plants have had to produce these things inside of them, whether it's scents or, or whatever they do to, to defend themselves, it makes them even more nutrient dense for humans to consume than if a conventional produce was grown with all the different chemicals on it, those produce items don't have to defend themselves about up from anything. So they don't right. have those, those chemicals, those phyto chem as many phytochemicals inside of them. So yeah. those eggplants are going to be good. <laughs> good for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and also a lot of gardeners, they, I, I see on the South Florida, South, South Florida Edible Gardening and Sustainable, you know, garden page that we have. I'm admin on that, and and also Cynthia Schaefer, she's the one that started that. We see people uh, suggesting to other gardeners to use um, use dish soap. No, I mean if you have to, just go with a very bare minimum because dish soap. It will strip 
the 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 natural defenses of the plant so you know that there's a a remedy uh, there's a video that i did recently about dealing with powder mildew you can find that on my channel it's one of the the most recent ones so powder mildew one of the things that i i recommend is in in a gallon to use only three dot drops of biodegradable dish soap and no more than what you have to because like i said it it just dis, it destroys the, the the plant a healthy plant has a way to defend itself and you're stripping it from that defense by using dish soap so what do you think about worm tea? I know of some people that say that they like to spray the worm tea onto their plants. I'm not kind really sure a... about worm tea, but I, I use a compost tea. I have a, a picture here of uh, compost tea. <clears throat> this is, um, so I have, I have worm castings in this as well as about three or four cups of compost and some kelp and you know that's just a very basic uh, recipe for my compost tea uh here we go if so if you're going to do a, a compost tea you need a five gallon bucket air pump because you've got to keep the microbes those good microbes aerated you don't want it to go anaerobic and then brew time between 24 to 48 hours your basic ingredients, like I was saying, about three or four cups. You don't want to do more than four cups in the, of compost, then kelp, worm castings, and or bat guano. Oh, that's interesting. So <laughs> then you can use this as a drench for the soil. I'll do both. I'll like in tw after 24 hours, I'll, I'll do the drench. And then after 48 hours, I'll do the foliar spray. Uh huh. Right. So you, I call it worm tea. What what you were talking okay. about. So that's and that's what Alice is just asking. What is worm tea? So it's basically a, a brew, right? Right. Of worm castings and the other things that you were mentioning. So when I first discovered the the science of of compost tea, I was so fascinated with it. I was telling people telling friends and neighbors about it, whether they were interested in gardening or interested in hearing about it or not, because I was, I was so excited about the science of how the microbes, um, you know, one bacterium of, uh, in the right condition will split off and have, I don't remember the, the numbers offhand anymore, but so one microbe can become, you know, thousands within you know 12 hours or so i wish i still knew those numbers but the whole idea is it just grows exponentially and that's what you're doing you're brewing the, these good microbes for for your plants and you, we want a healthy soil and healthy soil makes healthy plants healthy plants make healthy people Right. It just makes, closes up that circle. So did you talk about biochar yet? I don't re I remember in the beginning you were talking about amending the soil. Yeah. So I, I have used bi biochar and <clears throat> I, I was going to try making my own biochar, but I follow Elaine Ingham, uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham, and she's a soil biologist and who I highly, highly regard. She says that biochar is overrated they, she's done tests on it and her soil web organization that she has did some tests on it and it wasn't any substantial difference so she says it's high it's there's a lot of hype around it and you know i i part of me still kind of wants to believe that it holds on to the night the, the nutrients and it retains those nutrients. Her argument is you've got the microbes doing that. You've got the microbes that are, they have enzymes that extract the boron from like say the azomite dust, a rock dust that I mentioned. They're working on that. They're, they're extracting that. And then they're, they're going to process that. They're holding on to it and they're process it, processing it. And then they have, they develop a, 
symbiotic relationship with the roots. And the roots are providing sugars and proteins and carbs, basically cookies. They're giving cook. It's mostly sugars. They're giving cookies to these microbes, and the microbes are giving, you know, like say boron or magnesium, potassium, to the those roots, and they're delivering it to the. Another thing that Lang Ingham says is the roots will actually send out a signal the the plants will send a signal down to the roots that hey i'm deficient in in boron or i'm or uh magnanese and and so those those microbes get that signal and they're they're delivering it oh she it is so that, amazing yeah she she's, she describes it as calling for delivery of, of pizza hey i need some pizza and it's amazing. I I referred to Dr. Ron Weiss, and he was t telling, uh, he was speaking at a pre made a presentation. He was talking about how like you could have a row of broccoli plants growing, and a pest could go over to one of the broccoli plants and start trying to bother that plant. And in the soil, in the roots, that one broccoli plant, it's like a telephone pole it sends a signal to the next one, which keeps sending signals all the way down the road to all those broccoli plants that there's this pest in the area. Yeah. And the, the broccoli plants actually change their chemical composition to try to make them taste differently to the pests to repel it. And that was like what I was talking about earlier about how the organic vegetables and fruits are so much healthier for us, not just because they don't have pesticides and herbicides, but because they have more phytonutrients in it and phytochemicals in it because they're trying to repel these pests. But like you were talking, they they don't just communicate to the root system. They communicate to, to the plants that are in the vicinity, which is just it's just so amazing. Right. It is it, nature is just baffling. It's it's so, so amazing. So what you just described were the plants there's, there's something connecting where there's an underground network and Cynthia Schaefer talked about this and I think it was her soil building episode. And I have an episode that I'm editing right now and I'm, I'm hoping to have that on the channel too, where I'm going to get a little, I'm going to dig a little deeper on this subject, but basically mycorrhizal fungi, you know, once it's, it's developed underground, it can, so you, you could have plants on, on one side of the house, that are being attacked, like you like you said, by aphids, and the the plants over on the other side of the house are getting that signal, and they'll build up that protection against the the aphids. That's if you have healthy soil around your home. Yeah, that's just so spectacular. Yeah. So you talk about ladybugs. Do you ever get uh, praying mantis? I would love to do that. I would love. Yeah, I just. I, I, uh, you know, I, I don't know how long they'll hang out. I, I'm kind of afraid that, you know, after I order some, that they'll take off too, like the ladybugs do. Yeah, it is. It is kind of cool. I, yeah. I had, I, some, they, me, they're a little creepy though. <laughs> they're kind of cute, but then they're, but yeah. then I'm like, you're okay out here. Just don't, don't find your way in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those good guys. So, what do you uh, suggest that people do about weeds? Is it just get get in there every day and pull them before they get big? I mean, I don't, I don't have much of a weed problem in my in my garden because I do a lot of mulching. I will heavily mulch, and this is around my my star fruit tree. And what is uh, it, what is in the mulch? I don't buy store bought mulch. I, I I'll get a whole big truckload of of uh, <laughs> so this is in my driveway, and this oh. is about four three to four feet tall of, <laughs> of mulch in my driveway. I can just and, imagine what your neighbors. Well, I guess they know you by now. <laughs> Maybe the first time you did this, they were like, "Okay." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I I do wear a mask when I'm when I'm mulching because of if you have allergies and you get a mulch pile like this. This, oh, by the way, all this is free. You, if you develop a relationship with 
with a local arborist. They would, when they ship these trees down, another person needs a tree taken down, they take it down and they, they or even, even trimmed, they'll chip it up and they don't want to have to take this to the dump and have to pay a fee. They would much rather give it to a gardener who could put it to good use. And I gladly take it. I don't use this much mulch at one time anymore because uh, I found someone else that has a smaller truck and can <laughs> deliver smaller deliveries at one time. So what I was saying about the, the why I wear a mask and, and the, the allergies, if you have allergies, you really need to wear a mask when you do this. Uh, it, even, even with the mask, I'll have, I might have a cough, a mild cough for, uh, for, a, for a few weeks. I diffuse essential oils. So this is, here's my diffuser. <laughs> oh, that's really beautiful. With uh, tea tree oil and some other oils. But you want to be careful about diffusing some of those oils if you have pets. Right. So I don't, I don't do that around, around our yeah. cats. We, we love our cats. I would so say those... even if you didn't have allergies, I, I think, you know, just because of all the dust that probably comes about when you're uh, handling the mulch, I would think that that could just get in your lungs anyway. So it would probably be a good idea for anybody to wear a, a, some kind of a mask to keep them protected from the dust. Right. It's it's actually a lot because it heats up just like a compost pile. And when you dig into it, you got a big plume of, of uh, methane gas. And that methane wow. gas will carry spores of, you know, fungal spores that are not, it might be good for the environment, but it's not good to get into your lungs. So, yeah. you know, a lot of things that are organic, I, I've heard of... Uh, let's say the diatomaceous earth, also known as DE, to get rid of aphids. And, you know, yeah. I use that occasionally, but I do not breathe that stuff. I've heard of someone dying because they got too much of it in their lungs. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of mulch is okay to put around a tree trunk. Cause somebody, I thought somebody had said, don't put mulch close to the trunk of your, your trees or your fruit trees or something. Is that just like the robot mulch? No, I, I'm glad you brought that up because you can, I guess you can't really tell in this picture, but I do have the mulch pulled away from the trunk. Okay. You do not want to have the mulch, especially when it's fresh, uh, pushed up. Get, and when it's fresh, it's like I said, it heats up. To, it could get as hot as 160 degrees and that could damage the, the trunk. And then even after even after that, the mulch is holding on. Like I said, organic matter holds 10 times its weight in, in water. So all that moisture up against the trunk could rot the trunk. Wow. So I, I do have the, the, mul the mulch pulled, pulled away from it, but I can go 12 inches deep with that mulch as long as it's not up against a plant or, tr or tree trunk. Okay, well, that's good and, to know because a lot of people like to, even if they get the decorative mulch, they like to just put it all around yeah. the trees and make it pretty. And then they may have problems with their with the growth. And now that maybe that's something that somebody can learn from that. Let's uh, start with some of our questions. We have okay. some questions from our audience. Okay, Ben C., what are good sources for seeds? I'm so glad that question is, is, uh, is there because one of my, I guess my very first go-to is Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. It is, uh, their website is rareseeds.com, rareseeds.com. And if they don't have whatever you want in stock, my second go-to is Johnny Seeds. And I believe that's just johnnyseeds.com. Uh, there's a number of, of good ones. Uh, high mowing seeds is, is another good company. Um, you, I definitely go with uh, non GMO companies, companies that will actually test their, their seeds and they, they do their best that it's not 100%, you know, but they, they do what they can to, to keep their, their seed, um, genetics pure. So I, I, I respect that. And those are the companies I want to support. Right. 
And that's what we have to do. We, we vote with our purchases. And sometimes even, even lately, a lot of people feel like they don't have any power to make change. But that's one way that you can help make change by supporting these businesses that have the heirloom seeds and the organic type of things. Okay, let's get another question. Joyce, what are some tips to grow a pineapple from an organic store-bought pineapple top? That's something in Southwest Florida. That's like one of the things people like to do. I actually, I, like I admitted, I don't really have a green thumb, but I was actually successful in, in doing this. But I don't, I don't know if I really did it the right way. So maybe David can give a better, the best okay. tips. You know, like you would normally do, cut off the crown. And I like to leave some of the core. So I'll do like a tapered cut, leave some of that core on there. And then I'll strip off some of those bottom leaves because right where the, the leaves grow out of, those are, the, are where the roots are going to grow. And I will let that dry out for, um, I've, I've, let, I've got some that have been drying out for weeks <laughs> that I'm going to use in my garden beds just as placeholders. I have garden cats and I don't want to get my garden cats in, in my garden beds. And so I'll put tomato cages out there. I'll, it'll be a mess. It's something to kind of help deter the, the cats and the raccoons from getting in there and digging it up. That was, that was really good advice because I know yeah. that like I have a pineapple growing and then I have some rosemary next to it and I go to snip off some of the rosemary and that that scratchy pineapple leaf gets me and i didn't really think about that for deterring some uh furry friends <laughs> yeah yeah you know I, I like i said i i love i love our cats and i have my one that i call her my garden girl and i to help deter her from getting up there i built her her own sandbox and she loves her sandbox so she's got hers and I've got my boxes, <laughs> but back to the pineapples. So I'll let that dry out and, you know, at least for a, a two or three days and it, you can go for weeks and then you can either, I've seen people where they can root it in water and I've never done that. So, but I don't know how many times, how many times in a week you need to change that water. Uh, I just, stick it in the soil and let it grow the roots. I've got a, a pineapple plant that I'm growing right now that I'm growing a lot more of that and less of the, the store-bought ones. It's called white pineapple. The leaves, I could like feel the leaves and not not get uh, bloody hands because the leaves are not sharp like the, the other ones. I see my camera is really out of focus. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. I've never heard of a white pineapple. That's really nice. Yeah, it's but the the great thing, like I said, the the leaves are not gonna the the very tip of the leaf can be sharp. But mm. so that's interesting. Okay, let's get another question. Robin, is now a good time to plant garlic? I'm a newbie. Suggestions? Well, uh, not. Well, yeah, I guess if you're in South Florida, you could. I've I've heard. I had a discussion recently with someone uh, on our South Florida garden page about this, and she says that she's been growing garlic for the, the, for two years with no problem. And I don't know what her secret is because uh, I I thought it was just too humid. I've I've tried growing it, and it lasted for maybe three months or so, just for the greens. And she she grows it for the greens, and and also even if it's temporary, I guess it's it's a good thing to do because it's another one of those thing that things that wards off pests. It's a good companion plant, and that's the main reason why I grew it when I did. <clears throat> but so as far as when you know, kind of depends on what part of the country you're in, and I would look that up wherever you live okay if definitely. you are in south florida we're coming up on the cool months and yes you, this would be the time to uh, to get ready to plant that i wouldn't put it out yet i would wait until maybe uh september the end of september okay Let's see our question 
Joe, it will be the first time gardening for me in Southwest Florida, so I'd like to keep it simple. What should I start out with? I would suggest some edible landscape perennials. And my in my YouTube channel, I talk a lot about these plants that I recommend. Joe, you you should get these plants. I mean, get get a moringa tree, get get some longevity spinach, Okinawa spinach, sisu spinach, also known as Brazilian spinach, and all these plants that we call spinach down here. They're not related to spinach that you can buy in the store. Not related to it at all. It's just a name. I know for me, I I have a hibiscus tree. Yes. I did really well with that. And that's another one that's so cool. I mean, I, I harvest the leaves because I like to cut them up and put them in my salad. And then mm -hmm. I just take what's left of that, that twig that I took the leaves off of and I just stick it in the in the ground and then it wants right. to grow another tree so it, i'm a fan of these cut and grow kind of things because me too i, don't, I can just ignore them yeah. oh, <laughs> and they it, do well and joe get some katuk oh. katuk is great to have it's uh it, it's so nutritious and it has a nutty taste i think it takes tastes like peanuts and uh it's so easy to grow once you get it established. And I had no idea that it would get so tall. I have one that my my main Katuk plant has it, it was getting up to about eight eight or nine feet tall and I had to trim it back. I had no idea it was gonna get so big. Yeah, and that's just another one of those plants that you could just chop it down mm -hmm. and and it'll just keep growing like a weed, but you can eat it. I think that's pretty good because there are some people that live live with the uh, homes associations and and they're not allowed to have gardens, mm -hmm. you know, but they could have these these bushes and trees and they just look like ornamental plants and they can eat them. So that's exactly pretty, your pretty HOA cool. will not bother you with these plants. Yeah. So. Okay. Let's see if we have time for another question. Ella. How to prep soil for a raised bed. I think you, you want to just, she might have come in a little late. So okay. You right. can just so, say it quickly. Okay. Uh, for prepping my bed, I use mostly compost and I'll add worm castings and azomite rock dust. It's full of minerals. And, and then I'll do a, a foliar spray and a drench of sea crop. It's a mineral substance that, that comes from the ocean they extract most of the the salt from that you just want to follow the directions on that one that sounds great and then you know that all these minerals and and wonderful things are going into your plants and they're going to benefit you too after they benefit the plants okay let's have another question emily iguanas squirrels and rabbits oh my suggestions <laughs> wow i feel your pain i'm so lucky that i haven't really had to deal with iguanas as much i mean i've when we when they show up in our in our house they not in our house at our house they're usually around the pool area and they've not knock on wood they've not found my my garden yet so in squirrels, well, I have had a squirrel problem this past year. A squirrel discovered my mango tree uh -huh. and, you know, thankfully I had enough to, to share. <laughs> so, but one of my garden cats, uh, my, none of our, our garden cats really, uh, really hang out on that side of the house, but I got Mo, I picked her up and took her over there and put some catnip over by that tree you know maybe the squirrel won't want to be around where where the cat is just the other day i, I found her hanging out on that side of the, the house and i'm so so glad to see her over there so cats are a good deterrent um, for for iguanas i've heard dogs are, are are a great deterrent and i've heard that the cats too um they they uh the iguanas are i guess are afraid of them i'm not sure
As far as keeping them out of the garden, I've seen people build a, like a cage type of thing, pretty elaborate framing and, and then chicken wire. The Urban Farming Institute, what they do is it's a community garden, right? So a lot of the gardeners to keep the iguanas out, they, they put up a fencing, but a very unstable fence and iguanas don't like that and they will not climb any further so and then they were showing me that someone else put up a chain link fence which is stable and it didn't help the iguanas got in there isn't that interesting yeah. wow let's hope they don't evolve past that shaky fence <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about something uh, that a project that you worked on. It was a movie. And I wanted you to, if you could just tell our listeners and our audience, our viewers about it a little bit. This is a, here's a slide of, I recently uh, won a, a telly award for editing this film called Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle. I poured my heart into this film and it's only 16 minutes long and you can watch this documentary by going to protectnaturenow.com. And Dr. Elaine Ingham. It sounded like a great thing. She's in this film. And this has a story instead. about something that, that she was closely related with or tied to. Or about to share is breathtaking. In 1991, and I'm not gonna go into any details, but first of all, when I started working on this film, I had to pinch myself every day. I'm like, I can't believe I'm doing a Pandemic film for Jeffrey Smith and it has Elaine Ingham in it. I had just had goosebumps and just every day I was working on this film to begin with. I was just like, I'm so grateful to be able to do this. And I, I was like, now Jeffrey, I don't have images. Are there pictures or what do we have that I can use to tell this story? I, we talked about hiring an animator and animate something and we decided against that we didn't feel like that was the best way to tell the story so i shot some things i rigged up what it would have looked like what it looked like in my mind and so I, I had to make pesto out of some plants i have and make slime on the surface of the soil when she she talks about that you see my hand mixing up the sludge with the, the potting soil when she talks about the farmers put all the residues from after their their crops all the rest of it into a barrel and then they inoculate it with this organism and they open up the spigot two weeks later and there comes out alcohol to run their tractors well that's my rain barrel and my hand is opening up the spigot oh on the so that I had, was really I had, clever i had to be creative that picture it reminds me of in the beginning of when your presentation when you showed the before and after of of, of your house yeah you know <laughs> it yeah. kind of reminds me of that you know and i think i guess that's what this movie seems to be about we're you know yeah. what, what we do to our earth and and it's, how it can affect us one way or the other so right. it sounds like a really good movie Basically, to watch. something, some, an organism almost got out in nature. They were two weeks away from releasing this, doing a field test. Two weeks. Once you release it, there's no putting it back. Mm -hmm. And now is a really good time with this pandemic. We saw how this one organism, how quickly it spread around the globe. And now, you know, this, what happened in 1991, if that organism did get out, it would have made this pandemic look like a picnic. Right. Yep. There's a lot of things happening and we need to be aware and movies like this help make us aware because, you know, one genie didn't get out of the bottle, but there's other genies out there that could. So we, we all need to be aware. And I think that by watching broadcasts like this and going on David Stack's YouTube channel. When we watch these kinds of videos, we're, we're voting and we're showing the world that these are the things that are important to us. So I really I wanted to thank you, David, for um, coming on the show. And like I said, you do have your YouTube channel and uh, Stack's Urban Harvest. That's all you'd have to type in on YouTube and you could find all your great videos there. 
And I really want to thank you for coming on. And we'll put a link to the other show that you came on as well. It's really important for everybody to know about gardening. Even if you just want to grow some herbs in your windowsill, try something. And we all need to get back in touch with, with the earth and what it can do for us. And I'm Be Green with Amy, so I'm all about eating greens. And even herbs are greens. So if you can try to grow things like that, I think it will be really beneficial to you. But I really want to thank all of you guys for watching because this is, like I was saying, this is what supports this lifestyle, whether you're eating a plant-based lifestyle or you're growing plants or you're doing both. These are the things that we need to share with others. So if you click like, if you share this broadcast with other people, if you go on Dave's David's website as far as his YouTube channel, all these things really help promote this lifestyle of growing our own food or eating healthy food or doing both. Well, thanks again, everyone. And if you could please join me and David, as I say my tagline, you can just type it in in the comments so that you can do it with us. And that's be strong, be well, and be green. Are you ready, David? I'm ready. Until, until we see you again, remember, be strong, be well, and be green i hope you enjoyed this episode hey if you got something out of this please do me a huge favor click like on the video subscribe to the channel click on that bell so that you'll be notified when i upload videos in the future and let's grow together mm -hmm.